Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Today, we are going to be going over reducing boiler emissions and achieving sustainability goals. I'm Michael Sipes, I'll be your host today. Two presenters are with me today, Peter Knopf. He's been working in the boiler burner industry for about 15 years. He's been working on helping boiler rooms have a sustainable future and how to prepare them uh, for future regulations that might be coming along the line. David Oaf is also with me. He will be presenting <clears throat> uh, the second part of the webinar today, talking about how Preferred Utilities works with their customers to achieve their sustainable goals. David O has been working on boiler burner systems for about 30 years, and he's actually worked in California for the first few of those, helping California industrial facilities meet regulations. Thank you both for being here. Um, it's an honor to have both of you. And we're gonna go ahead and start the webinar now. But if you do have questions, feel free to put the questions in the right side questions tab, and we'll be getting to those afterwards. Otherwise, you can email Peter Knopf, which uh, his email is also in the questions tab. You can also um, just wait till after the webinar and then email or put the questions in. Either way works for, for us, and we'll be definitely getting to your questions. Thank you for coming today. And Peter, take it away. Good afternoon. On behalf of Preferred Utilities and Dave Oaf and myself, thank you for participating in today's webinar. Our contact information is on our website and on this slide. Today's topic is reducing boiler emissions and achieving sustainability goals. In this case, the egg came first with the Clean Air Act being established in 1963 to study and clean up air pollution. In 1970, a stronger Clean Air Act was implemented and the EPA was created to enforce the law. In 1990, uh, authority was expanded to enforce the regulations and the establishment of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And they followed six common air pollutants, particulate matter, ground level ozone, carbon monoxide, sulfur oxide, nitrogen oxides, and metals such as mercury and lead. Primary standards set limits based on human health, while environmental and property damages are addressed in secondary standards. Areas that are cleaner than the primary standard are called attainment areas. Areas that exceed the primary standards are non-attainment areas. Ozone and ozone transport. Ground level ozone is formed from VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and nitrogen oxides. Primary sources are cars burning gasoline. Other sources include chemical plants, certain chemicals, and power plants. Geography and location play a large role in a city's glow, or ground level ozone, or smog. That's the reddish brown tint you see over some cities. But uh, it can be influenced by lay of the land, temperature inversions, and upwind contributors. For example, New York City metropolitan area has a large problem, and that's led to the formation of the Northeast Mid-Atlantic states forming the OTR, or ozone transport region, and they've accepted more aggressive limits to their emissions. So these are the Clean Air Act National Ambient Air Quality Standards Table. You see carbon monoxide, standards of uh, 9 ppm, nitrogen dioxide, primary standard of 100 parts per billion, ozone, particulate pollution, and sulfur dioxide. The limits can be lower in certain regions, but cannot exceed these national standards. If you ever uh, notice a spec or documentation, quite often is expressed in pounds, per millions BTU. This is the way you convert from parts per million to pounds per million BTUs for the various fuels, as well as for the chemicals, the pollutants that we are um, gonna be talking about today. So this is a handy chart to, uh, to print out and save. Surveys show the, that the public perception is we are emitting more today and air is getting much worse. Despite this overwhelming perception, the U.S. is doing quite well. And 
actually the developing nations are uh, contributing to most of the world's pollution. As you can see in this table, we are track the EPA is tracking air quality uh, from 1980 to 2018. Carbon monoxide emissions have gone down by 83% in those 38 years, lead by 99%, primarily through uh, taking lead out of uh, f car fuel, uh, gasoline. Nitrogen dioxide is down by 65%. Ozone is down by 31%. They didn't collect particulate matter data back then, uh, not until 2000. And sulfur dioxide emissions are down by 91%. Here's another way to look at it, a nice uh, little easier to look at graph, where the uh, center line of the x-axis is the most recent national standard. As you can see, all the uh, various pollutants are tracking down and are uh, considerably below, most of them are considerably below the national standard. The U.S. NOx air quality from 1980 to 2018, as you can see, we're above what is now the national standard of 100 uh, early on. Uh, but about the early 2000s, we dropped below that standard, and uh, today we're quite a bit below that. And that's measured uh, daily max one hour averages. Since most of us are in the Northeast, this is a uh, graph showing the Northeast emissions from 2000 to 2018, the same uh, daily max one hour average. So that's a 34% decrease in the regional average. There are three main ways to reduce emissions. There's pre-combustion uh, choices, there are combustion methods, and then there's post-combustion methods. We're gonna discuss those separately. Fuel selection is one of the most important factors in minimizing emissions. As you can see, these are expected emissions of NOx and carbon monoxide from natural gas combustion burned, combusted in various types of boilers, large wall-fired boilers, small boilers, tangentially fired boilers, as well as residential furnaces. The uh, emission factor rating simply indicates the uh, quality of the data, the number of sample sets that they have to back this data up. Another table here. These are emission factors for the criteria pollutants and greenhouse gases from natural gas combustion. And those are listed uh, carbon dioxide, lead, NOx, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, total organic compounds, methane, and volatile or organic compounds. Now, most of these statistics you're going to see are going to be expressed, corrected, to 3% oxygen. So it's very important that you do that and not very many installations are right at 3%. So when you look at the raw data, you always must correct it to 3% oxygen. David, is that wet or dry oxygen? It really doesn't matter. If you're measuring NOx wet, uh, you would use your wet O2. If you're measuring NOx dry, you would use your dry O2. Okay. As long as you're consistent, it, the formula works. It is important to note that combustion has passed through components. Pollution from sulfur, lead, mercury, and particulate matter are not influenced by combustion technology. They're in the fuel and pass through the combustion process. Table 1.3.1 shows various fuel oils, emissions, expected emissions for SOX, NOx, and CO. Uh, for different size types of fuel oils. And it's important to see the, uh, the differences in residential furnace, as well as the previous slide, the natural gas emissions. So far, we've discussed pre-combustion techniques to reduce emissions, mainly fuel selection. Next, we'll talk about operational changes, but I want to take this time to point out the EPA uh, website and the wealth of information that's available there. Um, earlier you saw air trends that uh, came right off of the EPA website and recently just saw the statistics on fuel 
uh, characteristics. And all this and more uh, information is available at epa.gov. Uh, so next we're going to start talking about operational changes to reduce emissions. Uh, obviously, there are things like good boiler tuning and uh, lean excess air that are can improve performance and efficiency in any operation. But mainly we'll be uh, discussing the uh, reduction of pollutants that are not passed through pollutants, but uh, optimizing combustion and efficiency by improving the combustion process. So focusing on NOx emissions, NOx is usually 97% nitric oxide and 3% nitrogen dioxide, but it is formed in three distinct different ways. It can come from fuel NOx, thermal NOx, and prompt NOx. Fuel NOx is oxidation of the nitrogen molecules attached to the hydrocarbon chains inside the fuel. The thermal NOx is NOx formed by disassociating nitrogen molecules in the air that join with the oxygen in the air to form nitric oxide. So two distinct different areas and sources for the nitrogen. And finally, prompt NOx, which is formed from the rapid reaction of atmospheric nitrogen with hydrocarbon radicals. Now, I wanted to insert here where we, you've, we've seen pollu pollutants characterized in a few different engineering units. When you see uh, pollutants characterized as parts per million, it's important that you correct for the oxygen level in the stack because that influences the uh, statistics. You take the formula shown here, actual NOx times 20.9 minus 3, divided by 20.9 minus your actual measured oxygen. And this works for CO as well as any of the other uh, stack pollutants. Fuel NOx reduction, oxidation of the fuel bound nitrogen molecules that are attached to the hydrocarbon chains. Uh, single burner fuels, um, the only way to do it is by burning cleaner fuels. Multiple uh, burner boilers, larger boilers, can use fuel staging techniques to reduce NOx. Um, and the approach there, the strategy is to convert the hydrocarbon fuel to carbon monoxide in a sub stoichiometric or fuel rich environment, and then convert the CO to CO2 and water vapor in a high excess air environment. This can be done in utility boilers through burner tuning over fire airports and putting some burners out of service. Obviously, these methods are not available in a single burner boiler or furnace, and the only way to achieve that is by changing the fuel. Thermal NOx reduction. The disassociation of nitrogen molecules in combustion air follows an Arrhenius relationship, which means the percentage of nitrogen molecules broken into nitrogen ions has a logarithmic relationship to temperature. So reduce the NOx to reduce the thermal NOx, combustion engineers reduce the peak temperature of the flame. This is done with burner fuel and air staging to slow combustion and flue gas recirculation that spreads the enthalpy of combustion over a higher mass flow denominator and lowers the oxygen content at the flame so that more nitrogen radicals reform with other nitrogen radicals to make a diatomic nitrogen again, reducing the concentration of oxygen in the combustion zone, increasing the concentration of nitrogen in the combustion zone, reducing the peak combustion temperature, and reducing the amount of time that the combustion gases remain at the elevated temperature will reduce thermal NOx formation. This is a schematic of internal flue gas recirculation, and it's a smart design of the burner nozzles and a swirler. Uh, FIR is a NOx reduction technique applicable to boilers that burn gaseous fuels only. It is similar to FGR, except that a portion of the flue gas is mixed with the fuel instead of the combustion air. Use of this technique has several advantages. It lowers the peak flame temperature, reduces the oxygen concentration, in the combustion zone, improves the fuel air mixing and reduces the time under NOx formation conditions. When the same volume of flue gas is used, 
FIR can be more effective at reducing NOx than FGR. To minimize possible confusion, caution should be exercised when the acronym FIR is encountered because it is used to represent both fuel-induced recirculation and forced internal recirculation. This schematic shows external flue gas recirculation, which accomplishes the same type of a thing by reducing the, uh, the, the temperature, the combustion temperature. And it is just the external feeding of the flue gas uh, from the stack or the last pass of the boiler back into the combustion air and where it mixes in the fan or the wind box and is reintroduced into the uh, furnace. It is very effective against thermal NOx formation, but this technology is a little bit older and it goes back to the 1980s. Prompt NOx. The most effective NOx emission control strategy is one which NOx formation is reduced as much as possible and boiler performance is affected as little as possible, except in advanced burner concepts where air and fuel are premixed, combustion at either low or very high excess air levels results in low NOx formation. For most low NOx uh, boilers, the best combination of low NOx formation and high boiler efficiency occurs when the amount of oxygen is just enough to ensure complete combustion. Operation at very low excess air levels can cause problems it can result in incomplete combustion and the formation of CO that causes boiler efficiency to decrease. In addition, it can create unsafe conditions inside the boiler that can lead to an explosion. CO emissions reduction. CO is caused by incomplete combustion. CO emissions in a typical boiler or furnace realistically always less than 10 parts per million. CO emissions are caused by fuel-rich combustion, not enough air to mix with the fuel, and too lean a combustion where there's uh, too much combustion air. Flame, and it can also be caused by flame impingement on the tubes or the uh, furnace wall or cool refractory. The flame could be too small, so it's not getting above the critical 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. It is much more common to have CO emissions at low fire than at high fire. So in summary, we've got NOx abatement methods, fuel NOx, use a cleaner fuel, thermal NOx, reduce your peak flame temperature, and prompt NOx, improve mixing and eliminate rich zones, and post-combustion post treatment, uh, which we're not going to discuss today, but just so you know and also available on the EPA website, SCR and catalyst beds and chemical injections and, and that area is really developing quite rapidly in the last few years. So uh, with that I'm going to pass the baton over to Dave Oaf uh, who will talk about carbon reduction strategies in the boiler room. Dave, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'm Dave Oaf. I'm the sales manager at Preferred Utilities. I have been a burner combustion engineer since the early 1990s, and I actually worked in Southern California where Lonox technology really started with Rule 1146 that uh, mandated that if, you were, if your boiler didn't have a Lonox burner on it, you had to trash it and install a Lonox burner. So we were very busy retrofitting boilers to Lonox burners in the early 90s. And uh, as those slides from Peter show, we've done a very effective job at reducing NOx emissions in, this uni in the United States. So much so that when, you, when fossils like Peter and I talk about emissions, we, we assume we're talking about NOx and CO and SO2. Uh, it seems like anybody under 30, they don't know what air pollution really is in the United States. So when you talk to them about emissions, they immediately start talking about or start thinking about CO2. And CO2 is what we're going to talk about now and, and how you can reduce CO2 emissions in the boiler. So we're going to start small and end big, uh, beginning with fuel efficiency improvements you can make in the boiler room. So it stands to reason that if you burn less fuel, you're going to release less carbon. And we've been 
using various technologies over the last 30 or 40 years as fuel prices have increased to increase the efficiency of burners for the economic payback. But by decreasing the amount of fuel you burn, you also decrease the amount of CO2. So what you can do, uh, you can retrofit to a high performance burner that will lower excess air, increase burner turndown, and if you employ a control system known as oxygen trim, you can lower your real world excess air or your operating excess air even further. So efficiency gains of five to eight percent of fuel consumption are possible, and that corresponds to five to eight percent uh, carbon emission reduction. Another thing you can do is you can reduce the amount of electricity you're consuming in your boiler room. We do this by replacing across the line motor starters with variable speed drives. And usually we will start with the biggest blowers or the biggest motors in the boiler room, and that's usually the, uh, the force draft fans on the burners. Uh, we might put VFDs on the induce fan, induced draft fans, and sometimes we'll put VFDs on the feed water pumps. But typically we start at the largest motor because that's where the ROI is the most, and that's the, the FD fan. And the conversion between electricity and CO2 uh, depends on where you are. And uh, the way to calculate this is to go to the EPA's website. They have a calculator there called AVERT, which is an acronym for something or other. Uh, the national average is um, you release 7.07 .07 times 10 to the negative fourth tons of CO2 per kilowatt hour reduced. Uh, that number varies from place to place depending upon uh, how much fossil fuel is used to create electricity where you live. So the way the VFD works is by reducing the fan speed at lower boiler horsepowers, you reduce your electrical consumption. And this chart shows um, combustion airflow versus boiler horsepower. The top line is a traditional burner with an across the line motor starter that is somewhat analogous to driving with your foot on the gas and your foot on the brake at the same time. We run the fan at 60 hertz and we throttle it back with a damper. When we put a variable speed drive on the FD fan, we'll use a little bit of damper control at low fire, but the goal is to get that damper open as, as quickly as possible as you move up to the higher firing rates. And then uh, once the damper is full open, then we start increasing the VFD speed. So that gap between the top curve and the bottom curve is your brake horsepower or uh, electricity kilowatt hour savings. So this is the equation you use to calculate electrical savings for different VFD speeds. Uh, it's one minus your actual speed divided by 60, uh, all that to the third power. So if you run the FD fan VFD at 30 hertz, your electrical savings is 87 and a half. At 20 hertz, the electrical savings goes to 96.3. So there's a lot of electrical savings to be had uh, by slowing down your fans. And the conversion, uh, just as a reminder, is 7.07 .07 times 10 to the negative fourth tons of CO2 per kilowatt hour reduced. To estimate the fuel and electricity efficiency gains possible with a burner and controls retrofit, you can use Preferred's online energy saver payback tool. You input the excess air, stack temperature, and load profile of your existing burner, as well as the performance of the proposed new burner, and the web app estimates your fuel, electricity, and carbon savings. You can input your fuel, electricity, and retrofit costs and the web app will have an ROI for the upgrade. The web app doesn't calculate CO2 savings from the electricity reduction yet, but it's on our list of things uh, for our programmers to do. But for now, you can use the, uh, the AVERT calculation uh, for your region. So the second strategy you can use to reduce your CO2 emissions is to switch from one fossil fuel to another, uh, switching from a very carbon intensive fossil fuel to a less carbon intensive fossil fuel. And this chart shows the pounds of CO2 you produce per million BTU of different fuels. Natural gas is the lowest and uh, different types of coal are the highest. So I made this chart 
to show you what the percent reduction in carbon is uh, switching from one fuel to another. So you start in the first column there. If you're switching from number two oil and going to natural gas, your carbon emissions reduction will be about 28%. And this is just based upon the, uh, the stoichiometry of burning the different fuels. And if you remember your high school chemistry well enough, uh, you can write out the stoichiometry equations and check me. All central steam plant boilers can be converted to natural gas firing, including field-directed water tube boilers, packaged water tube boilers, and packaged fire tube boilers. In most cases, new burners and controls will be required. So burner retrofits require expertise in combustion and boiler controls for best results. In most cases, the burner will have to be replaced. Sometimes a new burner insert can be made to fit into the existing wind box. This video shows a crew replacing the burner in a trademarked Cleaver Brooks boiler with a new preferred burner. As you can see, with guys working really fast, this was done in 41 seconds. This was a fuel switching project at Bates College where they switched to a renewable fuel and achieved 82% carbon emissions reduction, but I'm skipping ahead. When you're doing a burner retrofit, it's important to include a vendor knowledgeable in both burners and controls that will walk the boiler room with a representative from the plant and make a replace or reuse decision for each of the following components. The wind box burner fan assembly, the flame safeguard and fuel air ratio controls, uh, instrumentation including pressure and flow transmitters, motor starters, and VFDs. Why spend money replacing perfectly good equipment if it will work with the new burner? So the final carbon reduction strategy we're going to talk about is converting from a fossil fuel to a renewable fuel. And the idea with renewable fuels is we are taking carbon that was already in the biosphere and burning it. We're not taking carbon that was 8,000 feet under the ground in the form of fossil fuels and putting that into the atmosphere. So when we talk about landfill gas or digester gas or some of the liquid fuels are going to come up uh, in a few slides. This is carbon that was recently uh, trapped and we're putting it back into the atmosphere. We're not taking long cycle carbon from the dinosaur period and putting it into the air. So everybody in the boiler burner industry is familiar with landfill gas and digester gas. Both are renewable fuels made from renewable sources. We've been burning these fuels since at least the 1980s. The problem is they're gaseous fuels that can't be economically transported any distance. And even if you had the real estate to put in a lagoon or a digester gas in the middle of your campus, you're not going to want to do it because of the smell. Preferred works with two suppliers of liquid fuels. Ensign manufactures a fuel called Renewable Fuel Oil, or RFO, and REG manufactures a fuel called Biodiesel Residual Oil. Both of these fuels are liquids, so they can be put on a truck or they can be put on a rail car and delivered directly to your facility from where they're made. This unphotoshopped picture is proof. So Ensign makes renewable fuel oil, or RFO for short. It's made from tree trimmings from harvest residues or commercial tree plantation thinnings. If this biomass wasn't made into RFO, it would be burned or left to decompose and the CO2 would have hit the atmosphere soon anyway. RFO has been approved for all regulatory credits for renewable fuel oils, including RENs and RECs. This is a very simple diagram explaining where RFO comes from. The end products are liquid smoke, renewable feedstocks sold to petroleum refineries, and RFO for steam and hot water plants. By the way, when you burn RFO in your boiler, it produces a very nice wood smoke aroma. RFO is considered to be biogenic, so greenhouse gas emissions from RFO are about 88% lower than number two oil and 82% lower than natural gas. Virtually any fire tube or water tube boiler can be converted to fire RFO. RFO is acidic, so everything in contact must be made out of stainless steel. The greenhouse gas emissions reductions for the, this fuel, it's not 100% because it does take some fossil fuel to make the renewable fuel and to transport it to the plant where it's going to be burned. Ensign, the manufacturer of RFO, typically amortizes the cost of the fuel conversion in a five-year fuel contract. 
Even with the fuel switching costs, the price of RFO is close to the price of natural gas on a comparable BTU basis. Preferred is converted boilers at three facilities to RFO, uh, Bates College, Youngstown Thermal, and a CRNC facility in Ontario, Canada. So the video I showed you earlier was Bates College. They've converted two of their central steam plant boilers to RFO. As soon as our technicians finish tuning up the new burners, Bates issues a press release touting their success reducing greenhouse gas emissions at their campus. The URLs are there, or you can Google the words Bates and Renewable and you'll find these articles. Actually, last summer, Bates announced that they are greenhouse gas or carbon neutral, um, mainly because of efficiency improvements to the campus and converting their central steam plant over to RFO. Preferred is also working with REG, the nation's largest supplier of biodiesel. They make a fuel called biodiesel residual oil. Think of bioresidual oil as the number six oil of biodiesel. It has the appearance of dirty french fry oil, but it has actually undergone extensive cleaning to remove impurities such as ash, heavy metals, and water. Preferred started burning bioresidual oil in our two shop boilers in June two years ago. The burner on the left is a 1950s vintage preferred rotary cup burner designed to fire number six oil. The burner on the right is our state-of-the-art low emissions ranger burner. They are both burning bioresidual oil. This is the startup data from one of the two boilers. Important things to note include bioresidual oil needs to be heated to 160 to 165 degrees F. If the existing burners that you're trying to burn bioresidual oil in are using number six or number four oil already, they will have a pump and heater set that could be reused. Note, the combustion efficiency is similar to number two oil. Stack CO is less than 10 parts per million. This is considered clean combustion for any fuel. Opacity was zero throughout the boiler load. In fact, these burners were firing number six oil before we changed them out to bioresidual oil. It took no new equipment, not even a new oil tip, to burn the bioresidual oil. Preferred's two boilers have been firing bioresidual oil all through the 2018-2019 heating season and the most recent 2019-2020 heating season with no unplanned downtime. We shut down these boilers each summer, we open them up, and we've found no unusual ash or sooting of the boilers. We fired them up again last summer for a show and tell with no issues at all. The price of bioresidual oil is generally less than number two fuel oil. Fuel switching costs vary widely depending on the existing combustion equipment. So the ideal bioresidual oil candidate is a facility that already has a pump and heater set, so already firing number six or number four oil. They can reduce their greenhouse emissions by up to 80% and spend less for fuel than number two oil. There are a lot of facilities in the Northeast that are still burning number six and are planning to switch to number two in the near future. These plants can switch to RFO or bioresidual oil and exceed all existing and proposed carbon emission reduction goals. So that's my part for reducing carbon emission in your boiler room. We're gonna go live now and take your questions. You can email your questions to uh, Peter Knopf or you can put your question in the chat and we will take them there. And thank you for attending. Do we have any questions out there? I've got a couple here on email. Um, William Board writes, if my burner is smoking, is it producing high amounts of particulate matter? Dave, do you wanna take that? Yeah. Um... Yeah, if you're smoking, what that is, is carbon in the fuel that's not finding oxygen and not, not able to form CO2. So you're producing uh, relatively pure carbon out the stack. And uh, in that slide where I was trying to make the point that uh, PM emissions aren't really affected by burner performance, that's true as long as your burner is is operating correctly. If, if you're smoking, that's an abnormal uh, condition that, that can be fixed with uh, by getting the right fuel error ratio uh, back to combustion. Thank you. 
Does anyone else have another question? Out in the field? Okay. Um, we got another email question here from Sue. Sue writes, um, Dear Abby, Dear Abby, if I put a new burner on my existing boiler, will it need to meet new emission standards? To get it back on the line. Just give us one second as we uh, we jump back on here. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, Sue writes a question. If I put a new burner on my existing boiler, will it meet will it new emission standards or will it be grandfathered to the old emission standards? Dave, do you want to take that again? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, um, the answer to that, to the burner retrofit question really depends on uh, where the plant is. Uh, Southern California, which really sort of led the United States in low NOx <laughs> regulations, um, their rule 1146 made it very clear what emission limits would be for new boilers and for, for retrofit boilers. So putting a new burner on an old boiler in other jurisdictions, it may not be so clear. So that's a question. Um, your local preferred person would know the answer to that question, depending on where you are. And that's, uh, that's a question you might want to contact the authority having jurisdiction. And what I've found is some places across the country where, where low NOx rules are relatively young and still in formation, um, sometimes you'll find that the regulators just haven't been asked that question and they've got to kick it around amongst themselves a little bit too. Peter, you work in Boston. What's uh, what's the rule on uh, burner retrofits in the Boston area? Uh, typically, they're going to want you to go to the uh, new standards uh, almost automatically. Just like buying a new boiler then? Yes. Okay. As soon as you change the burner. Any other questions out there? Um, David, can you hear me? I can hear you fine, Michael. Um, so someone was asking how much energy is used to produce RFO and bioresidual oil. Not sure if you covered that one yet. Might be a little longer answer. I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, obviously it does take energy to make energy in this case. Um, one point I wanted to clarify with, with RFO is that it's made from commercial plantation tree trimmings. They're not clear cutting forests to make this fuel. And Ensign works with usually large uh, lumber operations that can provide certifications that, uh, that the scraps the, that they provide um, are coming from thinnings and not from just clear cutting trees. Um, the other note to add there as I don't know a quantitative amount of energy it takes to produce RFO, but I do know that the amount of energy it takes to produce it is considered in the RANS credit. So it's considered and compensated for in the, uh, the credits you get for burning it. Um, another question I see here uh, from Gary is, RFO is highly acidic, what about um, bro? Well, RFO is actually a, a liquid-based fuel, so it has a pH of about two and a half. Bro is, uh, is a hydrocarbon. It's formed from, it's corn oil, that's a waste product from ethanol production, it is impurities distilled out of the biodiesel production process, and they also recycle and clean uh, cooking oil and put that into bioresidual oil. So these are all oil-based products and therefore um, not, not water-based at all, so not acidic at all. And when we converted our boilers over to bioresidual oil, uh, we kept the existing tank, we kept the existing uh, pump and heater set and the existing burner. We did burn out the, um, the sheath in our uh, electric trim heater 
and uh, and it, it wasn't stainless steel. We contacted the manufacturer, and they said that they actually had quite a bit of experience with this type of fuel, and said that uh, this component needed to be stainless steel because of the high heat flux uh, going through that sheath. And it's a relatively small uh, little piece of metal, so replacing the the carbon steel sheath with a stainless steel sheath in our electric trim heater um, was not much money at all. And now that's something we do uh, proactively when we convert somebody over to bioresidual oil. Um, another question is uh, from, uh, from, from Gene. It says, please clarify the fuel pollutants ratings A through D. We've got a pretty good handle on that. Um, the, and the and I think one of the earlier slides we had a, a lot of uh, statistics on the expected pollutants for combusting the, fol the following fuels that were in the tables, and the letters A through E or D were simply a confidence factor that the EPA had in those statistics. A was obviously a very strong base, a lot of uh, statistics to to call on. Uh, D, there were very few uh, statistics, very few subsets, and their confidence level was lower. So A and B were very confident, uh, a lot of statistics to back up their uh, numbers, and uh, a, a higher letter or a, a D or an E was a much lower confidence level. And you can find uh, probably a better definition of that at epa.gov and that's under the uh, one the 42 emission tables i wanted to include those ap42 emission tables because not everybody's aware of those and i find them to be extremely useful uh, if you have a question about what sort of nox or co can be guaranteed in in your boiler um, the burner manufacturers are going to be very knowledgeable and they're going to have experience with exactly your burner and uh, they're going to be able to tell you what they've done on other burners with a, and make a guarantee for you with very high confidence. But when you talk about uh, SO2 emissions or all those trace metal emissions, every once in a while we get asked to, to guarantee or at least estimate those. And since they're a pass-through and, and aren't really affected by the burner design, um, we just refer people to AP42. And if, if we're pressed to, to make a guarantee, we're gonna use the AP42 numbers with a, with a comfortable cushion. Excellent, I actually put up on the screen if uh, everyone can see the AP42 table. So uh, you can also, like you said, you can find it at the APA website, but uh, it's up on the screen for everyone to see now. Um, another question that is here, it's uh, what's the drawbacks to using a lot of FGR? Well, it's it can be uh, an unstabling uh, effect on a, on a burner and combustion, but people that know how to do it uh, have a good control of it and they, they plan for it. Uh, the downside or the disadvantage of it is it increases the combustion air blower motor size typically. Um, and that obviously increases your energy consumption and your cost. Yeah. FGR is really a, a great technology for reducing NOx. And it was, it was developed, I think, in the 1980s. And it was the primary method we used in the early 90s to reduce NOx uh, when we were doing uh, uh, retrofits in the Southern California area. And then, you know, uh, the rest of California uh, followed suit after Southern California, and then uh, parts of the nation followed Southern California. But FGR, uh, the only real drawback it has, like Peter mentioned, is, is your fan horsepower will go up, but you can get 75 to 80% uh, NOx reduction with FGR. In fact, uh, back in the 90s, there used to be uh, at least one company that would go and just put FGR, an existing boiler burner with, with nothing else, and use, uh, use the fan overage that, that you have in most burners to induce some FGR and get a pretty substantial NOx reduction with just FGR in a traditional burner. 
Nowadays, the burners are much more high tech. They use internal FGR and techniques to reduce prompt knocks. And, uh, and that combined with an external FGR, you know, can get you down below uh, nine parts per million knocks nowadays, which is considered ultra low knocks. Excellent. Um, another question is we have from, from Gary, it's Bates informed me that as long as we use the RFO for heat, we would qualify for the cleaner air emissions. However, if we use a small generator to cogen, then all the emission credits would be removed. Is this the same with Bro? Michael, could you repeat that, please? Yeah. Um, so the, qu the question is, Bates informed me that as long as we use the RFO for heat, we would qualify for the cleaner air emissions. However, if we use a small generator to cogen, then all the emissions credits would be removed. Is this oh, the okay, same okay, as Bro? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know what he's getting at. Um, both BRO and uh, an RFO uh, get a subsidy called RINS, and, and RINS an acronym for, for something. But um, these subsidies reduce the price of, of RFO and BRO, and RINS are actually traded on, on sort of an exchange. So when the price or the value of these RINS is really high, uh, both uh, the manufacturers of both Bro and Ensign can be more um, aggressive with their fuel pricing. But uh, part of the statute for RINs is that the fuel has to be used for human comfort. So it's got to be used for heating and cooling. I think if you were using the fuel to produce electricity, it might not qualify for the RINs. And I, I, I think that's kind of at the basis of, of what Bates College was saying. The people that are the real experts in uh, in RENs are uh, the compliance people at, at Ensign and, and REG, and uh, we did uh, we did we've done webinars in fact with representatives of both Ensign and REG, and they they are they are experts in those types of questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me see what else we have. Also, um, I know. I, I know we pointed out in the webinar we talked about upgrading your burner would you know increase your performance possibly burn less fuel use less electricity we actually have a tool on our website that will basically figure out for you how much electricity you're actually going to save do you want to just talk about that real quick david and i'll put the link in the chat sure uh, this is the uh the preferred payback calculator uh for Many, many years, it was an Excel spreadsheet that we handed out to people on uh, floppy disks. Uh, that's how far back this goes. About four years ago, maybe, um, we checked our math and then uh, put that uh, spreadsheet on uh, the web app where anybody can get to it. And it's, it's a pretty powerful tool you can put in uh, your fuel price, your electricity price. You put in the excess air versus firing rate for your existing boiler. And then uh, it allows you to put in a load profile too. So if, you're, if you have a burner that runs high fire all the time, you can put that in for a load profile. If you have a typical heating boiler that uh, idles or is even down all summer, you can put that in the load profile as well. and and get pretty close to uh, your realistic uh, fuel consumption. And then whether you're doing a controls retrofit or a burner and controls retrofit, there's fields there where you can put in the expected excess air performance versus load. And uh, it will calculate for you your fuel savings and your electricity savings and your CO2 savings. And then using the fuel costs for the fuel type that you put in and your electricity costs, it will calculate an ROI. And uh, this is a handy tool. We've run it a bunch of times. And what's interesting about it is the combined payback of uh, oxygen trim and FD fan VFD control is, is typically the same. If you have a boiler that is, is running high fire all the time, then you're not gonna be turning down your fan, so you're not gonna have a lot of electricity savings. 
but a boiler running like that is going to burn a lot of fuel. So if you can lower the excess air, you're gonna reduce your fuel consumption. Uh, the opposite of that is a burner that's, that's idling a lot at low fire. It, uh, it's not gonna burn as much fuel because it's running at low fire, so you don't get the fuel savings, but that's where you maximize your electricity savings. When you add the two of those together, um, it's very similar from boiler to boiler. So uh, that's just something we've found uh, running this calculation hundreds of times over the years. So it's pretty detailed. It's very conservative. Uh, when we've uh, actually gone on to put new burners on, uh, on boilers that we've run through this calculator, we've found that uh, usually the real life uh, electricity and fuel savings is a little bit more than what uh, the calculator here predicts. Um, which is right. We we should be conservative when we're when we're estimating something like this. And it's important to consult a professional as far as the targets you're going to put into the spreadsheet, as far as the projected new levels of excess oxygen, and as well as if you were to change the burner at the blower horsepower. If you're contemplating a new burner, the burner manufacturer should be able to guarantee uh, what the excess air is going to be throughout the load. And that, that would be the value that you put in. The existing excess air versus load profile you should have uh, from the last time the boiler was tuned up. You should have gotten a written report that details NOx, CO, excess air, um, stack temperature, all the important boiler information uh, usually at, at at least four to 10 load points. And that's what we would put in uh, for existing conditions. If anyone has any further questions, uh, Peter and David Oaf are, are available to answer them. And also, you know, we, we'd love to talk about maybe a facility you're thinking about um, changing, converting over to feel free to uh, reach out to Peter Knopf in the Northeast and then David Oaf uh, throughout the rest of the country. He'd love to, uh, to answer those questions. Um, so we used to do these webinars every month, but with everybody locked in their homes going crazy, we uh, we upped it to once a week. And attendance at these webinars has actually gone up since so many people are, are working from home these days. Um, Michael, do we have a topic for next weekend's, next week's webinar? Yes, we actually do. Uh, so we have it for the next two, two weeks. Um, the next week we're gonna talk about fuel oil filtration. And um, we're gonna talk about fuel filtration with Alex Canny. And then the next week, we're going to talk about cybersecurity in your boiler room because of all these new IoT devices in your boiler room that people are putting on. We want to make sure that people understand how an IoT device can somehow even interact with your boiler room. And we want to make sure that everyone's staying safe. But like I said, also next week, we're talking about filtration with Alex Canny. And um, he actually just did a fuel, a fuel oil one, how to design a fuel system. And now we're going to talk about fuel oil filtration, which is... Um, highly important, especially in emergency backup generator systems where you might need a generator to work when the power goes out. You can sign up for those on preferred utilities. Uh, we'll have links to those two webinars um, up there, uh, most likely tomorrow if they're not already up there. And uh, feel free to sign up for those and share those links around. All right. I know I'll be Thank there. You. Looking forward to it. Great. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming, and uh, we look forward to having you guys uh, again on the next webinar.